Hi, I'm Art Bergeron. Uh, and if you haven't seen one of these presentations before, uh, I am an elder law attorney. I work at Mike O'Connell. I do nothing but elder law. And the purpose of these presentations is really to have you, if you are older or have a relative who is older, understand what the issues may be that are confronting you. So to understand that, though, you really need to understand. Inevitably, when I say I do elder law, they'll say, well, what what's that? I mean, how is elder law different from other law? Well, to understand that, you need to understand how people's basic needs, estate planning needs, may change over time. So, uh, for example, uh, whenever I do presentations, I always talk about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And I typically am talking about them when they are in their 70s or 80s and talking about what their issues are at that time. Well, of course, Frank and Mary at one point were younger. You know, um, and, but the issue is that over time they are going to age. Right now in, in the United States, um, the actuarial life expectancy of a person at birth is about 79 years old. That's been migrating up since we were kids uh, and hopefully will continue to migrate up. As we all know, there's kind of there was a bump uh, um, recently as a result of COVID. But the point is that that your life issues change uh, as your life changes. So back when Frank and Mary were 40 and their kids, Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. were just little, they were, eight, they were 10, 8 and 6, they had a, a set of estate planning uh, issues to deal with, but they may or may not have had to deal with them. Um, at that time, they didn't have a lot in assets. They're, they had a home, but they had a mortgage, of course. They had Frank and, and, and Mary had some uh, savings. Frank had an, I, uh, an up 401k and Mary had an IRA. And they had some savings. They had some life insurance. Oftentimes, folks at that age, uh, that's life insurance becomes more of an important piece because you're concerned, oh, my God, if I die, what's going to happen? And there, there just aren't enough savings. So that's not an unusual Frank and Mary. And that was Frank and Mary back kind of in 1990. And at that time, they had a different kind of estate plan and different kind of concerns. They had a will. Uh, but in that will, they named guardians, actually, typically one of their brothers or sisters as a guardian for the benefit of their kids so that if they died and, the, and both died and the kids were under 18, there'd be somebody there that could be taking care of them. Um, they typically would have um, each other as beneficiaries on their life insurance policies. But then the question would be, if both of them had died, where would the money go? They would really want at that point a power of attorney and a health care proxy because those are the documents that you always have to have. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Their assets typically were held jointly, which means legally um, each person owned 100 percent of the assets. And if one of them died, the other person became the sole owner. So there was really no issue in terms of trying to deal with avoiding the probate process for these folks when they were young. Uh, but they may w have wanted to structure things in order to deal with these the, the issue of what happens if they, were, they died and their kids were still young. So their basic the basics was first they would have wanted a power of attorney. Power of attorney is simply a document that gives somebody the ability to act on your behalf. It doesn't take away any of your power, but it gives somebody else the power to also do it. So if you're incapacitated or just can't do it because you're traveling or whatever, there's someone else who can handle things. Things to know about power of attorney. Get it notarized. While a power of attorney doesn't have to be notarized, uh, unless the person you're appointing is dealing with real estate, it's really a good idea because people expect that it's going to be notarized. If you go to the bank, if you go to the insurance company, they're going to expect to see a notarization. Um, make it specific. If you want that person to be able to deal with your real estate, you want to say that. Uh, if you want them to be able to deal with banks, if you want them to be able to deal with your IRA or 401ks or with the IRS, uh, if you want the person with the power of attorney to be able to do gifts, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on as Frank and Mary get older. And then our suggestion is that you renew your power of attorney about every five years. And Frank and Mary should have one, even if they are still young. They should also have a health care proxy, because at any age you can get into an accident and something can happen. And next thing you know, you're incapacitated. Um, you can't make a medical decision because you're in a coma or you're just you're, you're kind of out of it. Uh, and someone needs to make decisions for you. And there's no one there who can. Uh, contrary to public po popular myth, your spouse does not have the ability to make medical decisions for you unless she also has the health care proxy. So some basics about the health care proxy. Uh, out of state ones are not valid in Massachusetts. Uh, health care proxies do not cross state lines. So if you're traveling a lot. 
You want to have a healthcare proxy and you can have multiple. You can have one for when you're in Massachusetts and then one for when you are traveling or at home or whatever. Uh, healthcare proxies in Massachusetts require two witnesses. They do not have to be notarized. They do not automatically give the person you're naming as the proxy so-called HIPAA authorization. That is the ability to, 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 to um, have the doctors talk to them about your, your medical condition and, and to see your medical records. So if, if you want that to be the case, even while you're not incapacitated, you also may want to do a HIPAA authorization. Uh, and the thing about healthcare proxies, a new one revokes an old one. So if you just, if you do a new one, you've automatically canceled all of the old ones. With powers of attorney, that is not the case. If you do a new power of attorney, you, 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 and you want to get rid of the old one, you actually have to do a separate document revoking the old one. Um, then there is the question, but now there is the question, suppose Frank and Mary got a little bit older and now they're 60. And they are dealing with kids who are now older. Uh, they're now Peter's 30 and, and Paul is 28 and Mary Jr. is 26. So in that situation, and their assets have changed, right? So regarding their estate plan, first of all, their estate plan back when the, when the kids were little was, well, we're going to divide everything among the kids. But if any of them is under age 18 or, or, a, or some age, we're going to put everything in trust. Well, now... In general, they may be saying to themselves, well, if we both died, we simply want assets to be divided among the three kids. But do you really? So the question that I often ask folks, if, if Frank and Mary are coming in and they're 60, is how's the, how are the kids doing? Uh, how are the marriages coming? Uh, do you think there's any possibility of a divorce later on? How are the kids doing financially? Uh, do, are there, does someone have their own business? Are there potentially creditor problems? Maybe are there potentially IRS problems? Does anyone have a, a disability, uh, um, especially a cognitive disability? Are there any um, opioid or other drug issues? This is a big deal now. There are so many people who have children uh, and sometimes grandchildren um, who have drug issues. And so the parents are very concerned that if they die, they don't want to be giving assets directly to that child because they may have a real problem um, keeping it and not using it. Um, or are there other mental conditions? In all of those cases, uh, Frank and Mary may not want to simply deal with a conventional will that specifies when I die, assets are going to get divided equally among my kids. They may want to make sure that the, that the assets, at least for the benefit of that child, are in trust. And, in more, and more in general, uh, they may decide that they want to make sure that if the two of them have died, because of course the older they get, the more likely it is that the, the possibility that the two of them have died, um, that assets will not have to go through the probate process. Because the problem with probate uh, is that assets do, it is an efficient way of making sure that assets get distributed correctly. If you die owning something and it's not held jointly with your spouse or with someone else, it's just in your name, and there's no death beneficiary, then assets need to go through the probate process. Now, probate is designed for a couple of things. First, it's designed to make sure that when you die, die the appropriate people get the assets. Uh, if you have a will, then the, the people who get the assets are the ones who are named in your will. If you don't have a will, the assets get distributed according to something called the rules of intestacy. The issue with that, though, in either case, whether you have a will or not, is that before any assets can be distributed, probate assets are subject to the claims of creditors. And creditors have one year from the day of your death to file a claim against the probate estate. And that can be a big deal uh, because it just delays things for a year. So if you have a child for whom you want assets to continue to be held in trust anyway, you probably, instead of having your assets go through this probate process, want to set up that trust now Leave yourself in control of the assets, knowing, though, that if the two of you die, these assets, at least regarding that particular child, uh, are going to continue to be held in trust for that child. Oftentimes, the folks will name one of the other children as the, uh, the, uh, as the trustee. But even if that's not the case, and if you're concerned, if you're Frank and Mary, and you're concerned about avoiding the probate process if the two of you die, then what you may want to do is create a revocable and amendable trust. Revocable means whatever you've put into it, you can always take back out of it. So it's, com it's so it's completely under your control. Amendable means 
amendable. You can change it any time. Uh, you would typically name the two of you as the trustees of that trust, and you would name the, 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 the surviving spouse as the sole trustee if one of you died. But then you would probably name your children or one of your children or a third party. You could also name a third party if you thought that there was no particular child who could responsibly do this or if the, having one child named was going to create arguments. You can also name a third party. Uh, any assets that are held by you in trust at the time of your death will not go through probate. Instead, even if the two of you have died, that new trustee that you named, the successor trustee, will become the sole, um, will become in control of all of those assets, and will have the ability to distribute all of those assets immediately without having to go through the probate process. So the advantages of doing something like this, well, obviously it avoids probate. There is continuing control, if you want it, of assets for the benefit of a child who may be, who may have some problems, or of grandchildren. If you are giving assets to grandchildren, uh, as opposed to giving it directly to the children, for whatever reason, then you probably want assets to continue to be held by them in trust for the benefit of, or by, in, by someone in trust for the benefit of the grandchildren. So there are a set of reasons for doing this. In the meantime, you retain complete control until you die. And for tax purposes, this trust doesn't exist. This is a so-called grantor taxable trust. For tax purposes, if you, you have accounts that are in trust, if you're doing anything that's in trust, you, you simply use your own social security number. When you die for tax purposes, your home, the so-called tax basis in the home, dump, jumps to the date of death value, just as it would have if the two of you were alive. If you sell your house, you still get your capital gains exclusion, just like you would have if the property weren't in trust. So that's a reason why people will think about moving things into trust. The other thing that, that, that folks start getting concerned about, though, as they get older, is that their assets pile up. So, so now, uh, at this point, Frank and Mary, uh, are, are 60 and they've, and they've got assets. Now they've got, now they've got more equity in their home. Their mortgage is down. They've got more equity. Frank's 401k has grown and so has Mary's. They've got some savings. There's still that life insurance policy. Uh, which at this point in their lives, given these assets, Frank and Mary may decide that they want to get rid of because they really don't need the insurance anymore. They feel that they, they may feel they have enough assets or not. But they are also in a situation where their assets are going to be subject to the Massachusetts estate tax. And, 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 which, and the estate tax, if one of them dies, leaving all assets to the other wouldn't be anything since an amount that gets, get, gets given to your surviving spouse is subtracted from the taxable estate. But if the second spouse died leaving an estate of $1.4 million, there'd be a Massachusetts estate tax of $68,240. Now, I want to talk about a little bit about that tax so that I can also explain how, if you're Frank and Mary in this situation, you can avoid that tax. And of course, avoiding the tax isn't going to save you any money um, because when you die, you're going to be dead. You're not going to be worried about this. But it could save quite a bit of money for the kids. So before you can understand how to avoid this estate tax, um, you need to understand a little bit about the estate tax itself. So for, for historical reasons that I won't go through, the, the, there are two ways in which you need to calculate, you would need to calculate your estate tax when you die. Uh, one of them results from the original estate tax chart that was created almost a hundred years ago now. Um, and it was designed at the, and it was created at the time that the Massachusetts estate tax was created, which was a long time ago. At which time, um, the question was, well, for, for the folks who designed this, so at, at how much do you have to have in assets before you're considered to be so wealthy that your ki kids should re be required to pay an estate tax before they get the money? And at that time, Really wealthy was $40,000. Hard to believe, $40,000, except I, whenever I think about this one, I always think about when my parents, who were uh, bought their, their two-family home to help raise the kids in 1940, they paid $2,000 for their home. So $40,000 is 20 times the amount that my parents would have paid for their home. That home recently got sold for $400,000, 20 times 400,000 is $8 million. So to give you a sense of that, so this was a lot of money, but the point is this chart has never been changed. 
And according to this chart, you, you start at $40,000, and, and at that, between $40,000 and $90,000, you pay eight tenths of 1%. And uh, at between 90 and 140, you pay 1.6%. It's a graduated system, just like the federal income tax is graduated. And, if, and according to this chart, if you were calculating your estate tax, if you died only having an estate of a million dollars, you would have an estate tax of $36,560. But wait, you say, how can that be? I thought that it's kind of common knowledge that if you have an estate, it's less than a million dollars. There's no there's no estate tax. Uh, and, and, and by the way, if you had this estate and you were using this chart, your taxable estate, if you had a million one hundred thousand dollars, right, would be forty two thousand six hundred forty dollars. And, and that's of significance when you get to the next slide. So. The point is that when you're figuring out your estate tax, first you figure out what you would have owed owing the using the chart. And then you figure out what you would owe using the what I'll call the alternative tax system. The alternative tax system is if you have an estate of less than a million dollars, you pay zero in estate tax, which then leads to the question, but what if you have a million and one dollars? Uh, and the way the, the answer to that question is for uh, using the alternative estate tax, uh, you you would owe 40 percent of all of the dollars over one million dollars. And when you're actually computing your estate tax, what you do is you compute it both ways. You compute the estate tax using the 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 um, the, the chart that I started with and then using this alternative estate tax, because as you can see, uh, if you have an estate of a million dollars, your estate tax uh, um, using the chart is zero, even though, excuse me, using the, the alternative is zero, even though using the chart it's $36,560. For a million twenty thousand dollars the estate tax is $8,000, still smaller than the amount using the chart, even though you were taxed at the rate of 40% on the dollars between a million and a million twenty thousand dollars, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you can, as you can see, because using the alternative chart, your dollars of new dollars are being taxed at 40% versus the tax that was that was being taxed on the original estate tax chart. There comes a point where the two lines cross and where using the chart, your tax is actually smaller than it is using the alternative tax. That line is at around a million one hundred twenty thousand dollars. So so until you get to that particular point, um, the amount under the under the alternative tax will be cheaper. Once you get to that point, though, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the amount under the chart is much cheaper. The point, though, is that if you're Frank and Mary and you've got an estate of, of uh, approximately $1.4 million, um, the effect of leaving everything to your spouse when you die is that you're throwing away the ability to have given other people up to a million dollars in assets. So the way to deal with that uh, is the is the a, an estate tax avoidance plan which you you've probably heard of. It is very it is structured this way. You create a trust for each one of the spouses. You make sure that it, you make sure that when the first spouse dies, there is enough money in that spouse's trust, which is going to then be held in trust for the benefit of the surviving spouse. And the surviving spouse can actually be the trustee and be in control of that money but that there's enough money for the benefit of the surviving spouse that when the surviving spouse dies, the surviving spouse's assets are less than a million dollars. For example, say in this case, remember the total assets were about a million four hundred thousand dollars. Say Frank took the, the house, they took the house, which had an equity, has an equity of about two hundred fifty thousand dollars and the savings, which has, which has about two hundred thousand dollars in it and put it into Frank's trust so that the total amount in Frank's trust was $450,000. When Frank dies, that trust, that, those assets, including the house, even though Mary is the new trustee, and even though Mary could at any time pull these assets out and give them to herself or use them for herself, those assets are part of Frank's taxable estate. Since Frank's taxable estate is less than a million dollars, there's no estate tax. But because of that, if we've now reduced Mary's taxable estate when she dies to simply the remaining assets, nine hundred fifty thousand dollars. Notice nine fifty plus four fifty um, uh, equals the million four that they started with. As long as we've done that, 
When Mary dies, there is no estate tax on Mary's estate because her assets are less than a million dollars. So the point is, um, for folks who have, for folks, and this is a really common situation, I have a lot of clients now whose total assets are over a million dollars, mainly because of their house and because of the fact that their 401ks and their IRAs are, have accumulated. In this situation, you can eliminate the estate tax by simply structuring things this way. Even if the total assets were more than $2 million, you can substantially reduce the estate tax by structuring things this way. That's one of the things that I talk to a lot of clients about, because if you're elder, but not really elder, that's your biggest concern if you're in this situation. Um, the issue, though, if Frank and Mary are a little bit older, say now that Frank and Mary are 70. Now they've got this estate tax issue because their assets are even accumulated more. Now they have a million nine in, uh, in assets. And by the way, one of the things I'd really talk to Frank and Mary about at this point is, why do you still have that life insurance policy that you're paying on? Um, you know, because you've got so much in assets that you're not going to need it. But, you know, obviously that's Frank and Mary's decision. But the point is, in this case, what Frank and Mary start getting worried about, certainly there is an estate tax issue. There's the estate tax, $96,000, 96720 um, which they may want to avoid. They also want to be looking back at their powers of attorney and healthcare proxies because they want to make sure that while they may have named each other in the old days as the healthcare proxy and power of attorney, they probably want to name one of their kids now as the alternate. But now they're also worried about nursing homes. They're worried about what happens if one of us ends up getting sick. Because our goal right now is to live in our house until we die and be buried in the backyard. But if one of us gets sick, say Mary gets sick, the issue is how are we ever going to afford the nursing home costs? Because the nursing home costs now is typically around $15,000 a month. Uh, and, and, but, so let me talk about that a little bit. The first thing, as far as Frank and Mary are concerned, what they should know is that if one of them gets sick right now, there is no issue. They can qualify for MassHealth. Uh, even though they own a home with no mortgage, and, and Frank and Mary have substantial IRAs, even though they have assets of $1,900,000, they do not need to have transferred their assets out to an irrevocable trust and waited for five years. Instead, they can just keep their assets knowing that at the last minute, if Mary needs nursing home care, they can shift all assets to Frank, as long as the house has an equity of less than $955,000. Frank can have other cash or cash equivalent assets equal to $137,400, and Frank can have unlimited income. So, if Mary needed nursing home care, we would simply shift at that point all assets to Frank. We would tell Frank to keep $100,000, take the rest of the money, which is putting him over this magic $137,400 limit, and buy an annuity. And as long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's life expectancy, which at that time at 70 is 14.4 years, then the day after Frank purchases the annuity, thereby converting a countable asset to a non-countable income stream, he reduces his remaining money below 137,004. The day after he buys that annuity, Mary can qualify for mass health. So Frank's real issue then is at that point, or even earlier if he wants to provide the protection, to make sure that Frank and Mary have wills, not just trusts, but wills with trusts that are in them, and have each will say, when I die, up to uh, uh, any of the assets that would have gone to my spouse are instead going to go in trust for the benefit of my spouse. As long as he structures things that way and makes sure that he owns the assets when he dies, Mary will immediately be, be able to qualify for mass health if she needs to later on. So the point of this, all of this is that your, your, what is elder law? It's about taking care of the, 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 the current lifetime and then estate planning needs of seniors, no matter how old, no matter how old you are, is starting with when you're about 60. Most of my clients, my median client age is 74. My youngest client is 55. But the point is your needs change over time from young to old, from old to much to very old. So if you've got any questions about any of this, I'd be happy to answer them. I'd be happy to, to just have you give me a call. Uh, but the goal of all of this work is to make sure that you're sleeping well at night. If any of these things bother you, then talk to somebody about them. If not, then don't. If you need to reach me, there's my, uh, there's my number.
You can also see any of these presentations by going to our website, Elder Law Frank and Mary, which is a YouTube channel. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.